don't you try and go through life worried if somebody like you or not. You best make sure that they are doing right by you. Uh, and the letter was beseeching him not to do this and saying it was a terrible idea for him to play a black man on the screen because they're black people should play it and it would take away from black pride and, um, and all of that if a white man were to play a black man. And I think this is nonsense, but um, I wondered if you do. Well, I think a lot of the, uh, a lot of what comes out of such a controversy is nonsense. The controversy itself, though, you have to pay some attention to why it happens. In this interview in 1972, James Earl Jones addressed a controversy where an actor by the name of Anthony Quinn of Mexican and Irish descent was slated to play the role of Haitian King Henry Christophe. The controversy centered around whether it was deemed appropriate for a man of such descent, literally a white man at the time, to be playing a person of such prominent African descent in a Hollywood movie. In the most diplomatic way possible, James Earl Jones, one of the most talented actors to ever grace Hollywood, gave his pushback in the most diplomatic way America had ever seen. Uh, just my own personal view of that, of whether Tony Quinn should play a black man. Uh, in this case, the black man was real, was of history, and I think I can't condemn Tony Quinn for playing that, only Tony Quinn can condemn himself if he does not achieve several things, which include uh, he has to evoke, uh, project a black man in appearance and behavior and so on, to the extent that the, we, we are different from white people. He has to, as an actor, achieve that. But he also has to achieve the essence of a Haitian, you know, mm -hmm. and add on to that all the other problems of achieving a, an emperor with that kind of great ambition. Uh, and if Tony Quinn fails at any of these things, he has condemned himself. But that's an, that's a, that's an actor problem yeah. and not a cultural one, you know. How come you ain't never liked me? Liked you. The range of James Old Jones is legendary. I remember first hearing that he was the voice of Darth Vader and it clicked. Yes, that's the voice that I heard in the movie. But he did more than just hold himself in high regard. He showed a generation of black people, several generations of us, how to carry yourself in public, even when you're dating a white woman at the time. And for many passport bros who are going overseas, what we can learn from him carrying himself in the way that he did was that you are always being looked at and you're always a diplomat. And if we don't learn to write our own narrative, other people will be more than glad to write the narrative of black men for us. But you're making an, you're making an excuse. Black. Blacks commit more crimes than whites do. They commit more, they commit more arsons, they commit more kidnappings. For example, blacks are 13 percent of the population and they commit 58 percent of all the murder. That's not a war on drugs. That's a culture problem. Why are so many blacks committing outside of their population? OK, let's take it back to some I, history. I, I'm, I'm curious let's for go, an answer to that question. I'm going to give you one. So let's go to redlining. Okay, redlining. Redlining yes. is why so many blacks are killing each other? No. As hard as this young lady is trying, she can't win this kind of argument against someone as seasoned as Charlie Kirk because Charlie Kirk is a very good businessman. He understands that there is a market for black men being degenerate and that we should look down on black people because black people just aren't good enough and specifically black men. He's giving his audience that and she can't win against it. But this is one of the things that happens when we don't control our own narrative because there's such a hungry market for people basically saying black men are degenerate. Let me yeah, exactly. If y'all ever see me make a black man play, hey, black man, if I make you play, you better not eat it. That's if all I, I make play. a black man play, I'm working for the prison industrial complex and I got to feed the inmates. That's about the only way I'm going to make their damn play. <laughs> California has become the first state in the country to enact ebony alerts to help find missing, missing black children. And I'll save you some time. They're not with their fathers. In my 20s, I mean, I always knew I was going to be a wife and a mother. I always knew that. And I was fine if it was mother and not wife. I'm third, I was a third generation single mom in my 20s. Um, as long as I got the babies, that's where I was at. But until I became the mother of sons, I didn't really have 
I didn't really see value in men in general. You think she's beautiful. You take her out on a few dates. You realize she's rough around the edges. And so now you want to go to Thailand to get a girl that knows 50 English words, but she's going to be so happy to be taken out of whatever circumstance she's in that she'll be your servant for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. It's giving me coming to America bark like a dog. Oh. Warner Brothers is producing a new movie in which Superman is black. And a black Superman actually makes a lot of sense when you remember that Superman was abandoned by his parents as a baby. Don't you try and go through life worried if somebody like you or not. You best make sure that they are doing right by you. He emerged with a style of humor that reflected the mood of freedom that Garvey had established. Richard Pryor was that comedian. And he's here to talk about his homespun humor. This is Pryor. Welcome to Black Omnibus. Thank you. What or who influenced you to be a comedian? Uh, I don't know. I couldn't fight. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't one of your most famous uh, skits based on an encounter in an alley? Uh, oh, yeah. It was a dude at home. I uh, used to know karate when it first came out. Uh, Terry Austin. Uh, he was bad. You know, he, Brick. <laughs> you know, that was just, you know, he'd walk through alleys, you know, all the time, you know. Then we had a man's alley, we called it. And you had to be bad to walk down through there at 11 o'clock, you know, because he would do it. And he got grabbed in the alley once. We paid old wino to grab him. <laughs> you know, just to see what would happen. He was bad. He was walking through the alley. I can handle it. <laughs> you know, and the dude grabbed him. You know. <laughs> You in a world of trouble, baby. <laughs> you know who you messing with. <laughs> you done messed up now. <laughs> of course, this is the video that many of us have come to understand when he spoke about his personal life and who he chose to marry. But he speaks on it not just from the point of view that he wanted to date a white woman, he spoke about it from a freedom of identity point of view, that if I'm going to be my own man at a certain point, I have to define what I want out of life and I should have the freedom to pursue it. Funny thing, when you talk about freedom, you're usually uh, uh, challenging the man. Uh, you're challenging him to uh, want to achieve anything he wants, to capture anything he wants, right? And uh, around the time he's 14, you, you begin to say to him, well, there's certain kind of women you shouldn't have, you know, and so on and so forth. Well, that's, that's one aspect of the problem. Uh, I, I, I think that, that thing that happens at 14 should not happen, first of all. A man should... Uh, should uh, pursue the kind of woman that either is in his dreams or is in his uh, you know, reality or whatever. Even my brothers and uncles was like, these out here ain't shit. You know, keep them around for a little while, get what you need, but you keep it moving. You don't need them. They just going to use you. Like they had a bad opinion of the men around them. <laughs> so Warner Brothers is producing a new movie in which Superman is black. In this version, black Superman's kryptonite is an honest day's work. <laughs> it was like, you know, what am I supposed to be looking for? But raising sons and seeing just how amazing um, they, are, they were as people, it really changed my perspective. And we want to defund the police and burn the city down and drag the police for their... Why can't the same be justifiable towards black males? Talk if we don't want to deal with black men at all. I love all men and not black men. Just okay. not black men. Well, is there is there any women here who don't want to deal with men, period? Or is it just black men? Or is it a mixture? It's just black men. And we actually want non-black non men's help in this corrections that you speak of. Daily, it's, daily, it's, daily back massages. It's, 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 right. it's giving me your royal... <laughs> is clean sir you 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 don't want a wife you want a slave so what are the what are the corrections that you're looking for specific force force because that's the only thing that's gonna work i just thought of another punchline for that black superman story. <laughs> black superman
Superman will be referred to as the Man of Steel, spelled S-T-E-A-L. <laughs> it is my job. It is my responsibility. You understand that? A man got to take care of his family. You live in my house. You sleep your behind on my bedclothes. You put my food in your belly because you are my son. You are my flesh and blood, not because I like you. It is my duty to take care of you. I owe a responsibility to you, wait. If we pay attention to the media around us, there are more than enough people that are willing to write a narrative about black men that does not correlate with the edification of black men. That black men are degenerate and not worthy of being good fathers and criminals instead of the dignity that we see from many black men every day that simply does not make it in front of a camera. What's so beautiful about the presence of the Superman giant that James Earl Jones was is that he showed a quiet, calm dignity of black men in the 70s where tensions were high and even dating a white woman he had a target on his back but he showed in his dignified response to a complicated issue that black men are complicated people that should be judged on an individual basis and we should not be judged by a sweeping idea that black men are all one thing or all the other but since you're not willing to say that he maybe he can't succeed at all those three things, then, then, you, then you wouldn't say that it's wrong for him to play the part. Uh, I don't know his, his acting talent that, that well. I, I, I admire many of the things I've seen him in, most of the things I've seen him in, including Viva Zapata, you know? Yeah. I, don't, I don't know how you pronounce that. Yeah. But uh, all, all I can say is he's made one implication, which I don't agree with, and that is that uh, there, the uh, black actors that are available to play that part have have failed to do so because uh, they feel that they're not qualified. That is an implication that I've heard and that I've read in a letter he wrote to a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I choose to disagree with that, that conclusion. Uh, I think that's the conclusion that he has that makes him feel more comfortable in the controversy. Um, the reason that I or uh, many of the other actors have not approached it is because we have not yet received a script that does the man's life mm -hmm. justice in very simple terms, in historical, cultural, and dramatic terms. I have not yet read that script myself. Yeah. And I have a feeling that Mr. Quinn, in noticing our rejection of certain scripts, one of which I, I know about in particular, that he has drawn the conclusion that we are not, we don't feel that we can tackle it, but it's just that we don't feel that we can tackle that character through what has been written so far. No, it does not depend. Well, if it you're Haitian, head. it might not be. Yeah, if you're Haitian, that's like, well, you go from eating dirt cookies to eating your, your, your neighbor's cat. You're like, wow, y'all let these run around? <laughs> In recognition of Caribbean American Heritage Month, I honor influential Haitian leader, Henri Christophe, Christophe. Born on the island of Grenada to immigrant parents, Christophe played a significant role in the American Revolution serving as sergeant in French unit in Savannah, Georgia in 1780. Christophe was among the 545 Haitian free slaves known as the Fontage Légion, fighting for the freedom of men and women who desired to be freed from the shackles of oppression. After the French forces were defeated and Haiti was declared an independent republic in 1803, Christophe was elected president of the Northern State of Haiti in 1807. He was responsible for the construction Citadel Henri in Haiti, introduced a monetary system based on gourds, declared Catholicism as a state religion, and established schools and hospitals, including a basic school of medicine. Let us honor the legacy of this great man who fought for the freedom of those who refused to do the same. Salute to Mr. Z Black in effect, as well as a variety of other Haitian brothers that I've had the privilege of coming to know better in my congregation in this space. One of the things that we're gonna see in the next few weeks is a narrative that's painting Haitians in a certain way because it's gonna serve a purpose for people that are not Haitian. If Haitians control the narrative about Haiti, we will get a very different story about Haiti because we understand Haiti did not exist in a vacuum. Haiti was punished because of things that they were successful doing. And much of the reason why Haiti is in the position it is now is because of that success and because they were punished so severely for what they were able to do. But that's not the narrative that you get if you don't ask a Haitian that narrative. 
And that's why it's so important for a Superman like James Earl Jones to show us 50 years ago how to control a narrative about black men. If he could cons convincingly be black, Haitian, and imperial, then you wouldn't mind if he played it. Many other things I wouldn't mind at all. Yeah. No, I, I think it's an actor's right to tackle anything. I yeah. would like That's to have I a think. crack at Ludwig van Beethoven. Yeah. I'm quite serious because uh, there's a rumor anyway that he was had black blood in him, you see. Yeah. But in order to, for me to tackle Ludwig van, I would have to uh, get a little straighter hairstyle than I have and a little lighter skin complexion than I have, yeah. you know? Yeah. among other things. The New York Times, June 11th, 1972, Alan Holly writes to Anthony Quinn. For generations, the film industry has manipulated the image of the black man and presented him as debased and degraded. We are still got to help us living with the screen image of Willie Best on The Late Show. As we move into an era in which it is finally possible to present the black man as an epic hero, how much progress have we made if dangerous precedents are set and these marvelous roles in their virgin outings are systematically poached by white stars, better equipped by virtue of their greater power in the film industry to seize control of them? Must we live through Alec Guinness as Toussaint L'Overture and Charlton Heston as the Prince of Benin? How much will any of us ever learn of the grandeur and the magic of blackness if all in our history that has been majestic and target then life begins to be relentlessly mined and plundered by whites in the present with the same casual cynicism that our music has been mined and plundered by whites in the past? Nevertheless, as a producer, one welcomes you to the ranks. Please do produce your film. There simply cannot be enough films done on this particular historical era, for it is a brilliant one and fascinating enough to support a whole new genre of filmmaking. All one asks is that you show a decent regard for the sensibilities and emotional needs of the black community and relinquish the title role to a black actor. For it is to a black man that the role of Henri Christophe, at least in its initial exposure, most rightfully and most needfully belongs. Sincerely, Ellen Holly, New York City. But I, I thought her, her letter was silly because, well, silly. She was no, not, like she Ellen, silly, but she was obviously deeply felt. But, but I just think she's wrong. I mean, I, you have to judge artistic things by artistic standards, and I don't think you should make political judgments about works of art, and they shouldn't forward mm. causes. Bertolt Brecht would disagree, but uh, he, but he can't. Well, um, uh, but, no, you um, see. You see, uh, uh, sorry, Brett there, fans, there's no you know. silliness in that. But mm -hmm. if you notice one thing, if uh, if Tony or you or, or anybody else who doesn't understand it had had read uh, the New York Times several months back, Ellen herself has uh, written a play which even I have not had the privilege of reading mm -hmm. about Christophe and uh, pointed out the problems that, uh, that a black writer and a and a black uh, producer has of getting things on, and she feels that, and I think rightly so that uh, she's being muscled out, you know? Ah, well, that, that's another See, matter. See, the man's life is, is uh, uh, Christoph's life is public domain, of course, but once a, once a large production moves in and takes the edge off, then it's difficult for any smaller production and, and uh, uh, less expensive production to come in and do it afterwards. Are I, you, I intend to do it eventually, you, I, yeah. but I'm in no hurry. I don't want to compete with Tony, you know? Yeah. When? but someday I will do my own version of that. So right. The greatness of James Earl Jones cannot be summed up with him having a spectacular voice or having a presence on screen that made him a super versatile actor. It was that he carried himself off the screen with a level of dignity that represented not just him, but a kind of black men that many people had not seen before. And for many of us that are going overseas, what we have to remember is that when we're out in public, we are a representation of black men that many people, again, just like James Earl Jones in the 70s, had never seen before. We are the ones that are going to write the narrative of ourselves. As a matter of fact, we write that narrative of ourselves every time we leave our homes and we are representing ourselves in public. When we do so, it would be a good idea to remember that much like James Earl Jones dating a white woman in the 70s had to have a good eye about what was going on around him and how he was being perceived. We, too, must be cognizant of not just how we look overseas, but we need to be proactive in writing our narrative, because if we don't, just like what's happening in America, people will use our president and write a narrative about us.
And we as educated black men at least deserve the ability to define ourselves as we choose to and write our own narrative because it's our kids that will be living in the wake of it. Thanks for watching. Like, subscribe, comment below. I'll catch you in the next video. Take care, guys.